Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to the uh, Woodrow Wilson Center. My name is Eric Olson, and I'm a senior associate at the Mexico Institute. Uh, and we've organized this conference today with Arizona State University. Uh, and uh, so we want to welcome you to Washington and to this uh, conference this morning. Um, in typical sort of DC fashion, people will continue to uh, come in here little by little. Uh, we had a tremendous response, RSVP, over 100 people signed up, so we moved it into this little bit larger room, and I'm sure uh, there'll be more people streaming in. So if you don't mind, try to give people opportunity to get to the middle seats, that would be great. Appreciate that. Um, we are thrilled to have this panel. This is the first in, in, I think, a couple of different activities we'll do related to the topic of uh, human trafficking uh, between Mexico and the United States. And we're really excited about our panelists and discussion today. Um, one word of announcement, we have translation. Most of the, all of the presentations except for one will be in English. Uh, and most of the business here will be transacted in English. But if you do require translation from English to Spanish, there are receivers out there at the uh, entryway. Um, and uh, Spanish uh, is on channel one, and English is on channel two. So help yourself to that. Um, as I say, human trafficking is a matter of grave concern. Uh, to those of us who worry about human rights and security and human security. According to the U.S. State Department's last report on trafficking in persons, Mexico <coughs> is a large source, transit, and destination country for women, men, and children subjected to sex trafficking and forced labor. labor. Mexican women, girls, boys from poor rural areas are subjected to sexual servitude as well as forced labor within the United States and Mexico, lured by fraudulent employment opportunities and deceptive offers of marriage. During 2010, the majority of trafficking victims identified within Mexico were from Chiapas, Veracruz, Puebla, Oaxaca, and Tlaxcala. The vast majority of foreign victims in forced labor and sexual servitude in Mexico are from Central America, especially Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador, the, the Northern Triangle. However, trafficking victims from South America, the Caribbean, Eastern Europe, Asia, and Africa are also found in Mexico. Many of the foreign trafficking victims in Mexico are en route to the United States. There's little question that this is a major problem. Um, and as the, the issue of organized crime has become uh, more uh, visible, uh, and we've seen cases such as the massacre of 72 uh, migrants in San Fernando and Tamaulipas, concerns have arisen about the connections between trafficking, trafficking networks, and organized crime. As bad and as extensive as this problem is, it's also incumbent upon us to be careful as we discuss it and look deeper into the roots and how it's organized and the links between trafficking and organized crime. I'm always uh, shocked by how much hyperbole I hear in the newspapers and as when I talk to people. So, we thought from the beginning it was important to do this uh, panel with people with real strong, uh, solid uh, research background who have done extensive empirical research, field research, who could really try to help us understand, one, the nature of trafficking, how it's organized, and its connections to organized <coughs> crime. To help us do this, we have a very uh, distinguished panel of folks, and I'm going to introduce them now all together and then invite each one to come and make a brief presentation. First, we'll start with Rodolfo Cas Casillas. He's a senior professor and researcher at Flaxo Mexico, 
which is the uh, uh, network of social scientists uh, around the Americas, uh, and he's based in Mexico. Professor Casillas has conducted extensive research on Central American undocumented migrants through Mexico's southern border. His research interests include the study of the conditions of unrecognized refugees, international transmigration through Mexico, Central America, Central American migrant children, humanitarian networks, and migration. So uh, he's the author of three books on human smuggling, as well of uh, multiple reports on the conditions of Central American migrants traveling through Mexico. Next, we'll hear from uh, Professor Sheldon Shang. Uh, he's a professor and chair of the sociology department of San Diego State University. His research interests include community corrections and reintegration and transnational human smuggling and trafficking activities. His publications have appeared in journals such as Criminology, British Journal of Criminology, and Crime and Delinquency. Uh, he's also published two books on human trafficking, uh, human smuggling topics, uh, Chinese human smuggling organizations, families, social networks, and cultural imperatives from Stanford University Press, and Smuggling and Trafficking in Human Beings, All Roads, Lead to America by Prager in 2006. Next, we'll hear from Dr. Gabriela Sanchez, a senior researcher at the University of Maryland's National Consortium for the Study of Terrorism and Responses to Terrorism, known as START. Her research interests include the social organization of drug and human trafficking groups, underground economies, and undocumented migrations. Uh, uh, and transnational networks. She is currently leading a study exploring the nexus between organized crime and terrorist organizations in Central America. Uh, she was the State Department's Born Fellow and a Fulbright Scholar uh, and has conduct conducted extensive research, field work on smuggling organizations in North Africa along the U.S.-Mexico border and through Latin America, and I believe she's leaving in two weeks for another Fulbright in, in Israel, right? So we're glad you're here. And then finally, I want to introduce uh, my friend and colleague, Eric Lee. He serves as the Associate Director at the North American Center for Transborder Studies at the Un Arizona State University. Uh, as the Associate Director, Eric is responsible for legislative research, policy advising, and con coordination with numerous partners in the United States, Mexico, and Canada on various collaborative initiatives. And we at the Mexico Institute consider ourselves honored to be a partner with ASU, with Eric Lee, uh, Rick Van Schoik, uh, and many of their projects and our projects along the U.S.-Mexican border. Uh, Eric, we've asked Eric, who's done extensive research on the issue of legislation on trafficking, to be a, a commenter, comentarista, at the end of this, uh, our three panelists. So without further ado, uh, I'm going to invite uh, uh, Professor Casillas to come forward. He has, a, they all have PowerPoint presentations, um, and we'll have time for questions and hopefully some answers at the end of the, this session. Thank you all very much. There we go. Yeah. Good morning, everybody. Everybody. The first thing that I want to say is thank you to the Wilson Center. Thank you to the Arizona State University for the invitation to this colloquium. And the second thing that I want to say is that you will hear my Mexican accent, but in Spanish. Voy a plantear algunas ideas principales en relación con la transmigración centroamericana asiática 
y africana que pasa por México. Cuando escuchamos el año pasado, eh, en agosto del año pasado, de 72 migrantes asesinados en San Fernando, Tamaulipas, muy cerca de la frontera con Estados Unidos, eh, llamó la atención la cantidad de personas asesinadas. Cuando analizamos la nacionalidad de esas personas, eh, escuchamos que prácticamente todos venían de algún lugar de América Latina, pero en ese momento no se dijo, como todavía no se dice de manera oficial, que entre los asesinados había cuando menos una o dos personas que venían de la India. Esa es la primera prueba irrefutable de que las redes de tráfico de migrantes de distinto origen dentro y fuera del continente estaban trabajando juntas. Es ahí cuando hay un cambio cualitativo por el hecho de secuestrar y asesinar a tanto migrante y segundo, la diversidad de nacionalidades que estaban involucradas. Es por ello que lo primero que tenemos que hacer nosotros cuando analizamos la situación que ocurre en México es que ya tenemos que hablar de cuando menos cinco flujos migratorios importantes. El primero es de la inmigración, que es poco importante en el número en México. El segundo es la emigración de mexicanos al exterior, que como ustedes saben, la mayoría están en Estados Unidos. El tercer flujo es el de los transmigrantes. Un cuarto es el de los migrantes mexicanos retornados a México a consecuencia de las políticas migratorias, particularmente de Estados Unidos. Y el quinto flujo más importante son los desplazamientos internacionales debido a los problemas de inseguridad que ocurren en México. Esos cinco flujos habrá que relacionarlos con cuatro que ocurren en Centroamérica. Una migración que ocurre dentro de la propia Centroamérica, una migración intrarregional, un segundo flujo que es la migración extrarregional, el tercero que es la migración inter y extracontinental y en particular cuando yo hablo de extracontinental me quiero referir a los flujos asiáticos y africanos y el cuarto punto es la transmigración extracontinental que va a formar parte de la exposición de este día. Nosotros tenemos que ver en este horizonte amplio el papel que juega la región andina o el cono sur y el Caribe en la articulación de los flujos transmigratorios que vienen desde esos lugares de Asia y África y encuentran plataformas de recepción legal en alguna parte del cono sur, de la región andina o del Caribe, o incluso de Centroamérica como puede ser Panamá y Guatemala, y posteriormente de manera al margen de las disposiciones migratorias de México y de Estados Unidos, hacen la última etapa del viaje para llegar a su destino. En ese sentido, México se ha convertido en la antesala de flujos indocumentados de cualquier parte del mundo que quieren llegar a Estados Unidos. Es así como encontramos una relación entre países de origen, tránsito, y destino transmigratorio, en donde la parte más importante es lo que ocurre durante el tránsito migratorio, que viene a complementar la atención tradicional en la discusión del origen y destino, que siguen siendo importantes, pero en el proceso histórico reciente, 
lo que ocurre durante la migración entre esos dos puntos cada vez se vuelve más y más importante. En ese sentido, nosotros encontramos dos complejidades en el tráfico de migrantes. La primera es que las redes de tráfico de Centroamérica, de cubanos, de asiáticos y africanos, que hasta hace unos años trabajaban de manera independiente, empiezan a generar actividades compartidas. En los últimos cinco años tenemos ya evidencia de cómo empiezan a compartir algunas actividades, no todas, y tampoco se fusionan las redes, pero sí empiezan a tener actividades compartidas. Y segundo, eh, segunda complejidad, es que eh, el crimen organizado encuentra en la transmigración un nuevo nicho de mercado delictivo. El secuestro masivo es la expresión más actualizada de esta nueva fase. Algunas de las eh, características de este nuevo nicho de mercado delictivo y sus eh, consecuencias las tenemos en lo siguiente. Primero, que pasamos de la práctica del secuestro express al secuestro masivo. El secuestro express se empezó a practicar al término de la administración Fox, eh, estoy hablando de 2004-2005, y el secuestro express eh, consiste en la captura rápida de algunos migrantes y una gestión rápida con sus familiares en Estados Unidos para cobrar un rescate en una actividad que no pasa más allá de tres, cuatro días. Cuando encuentran que esta actividad es eh, importante, va a cambiar al secuestro masivo, del cual les practicaré en un momento más. El segundo, eh, segundo elemento es que para realizar este tipo de actividad se necesita tener un control territorial y de las actividades sociales que incluye la movilidad de las personas. Eso se va a ver particularmente en la frontera norte de México y más específicamente por el lado de Tamaulipas, porque en el estado de Tamaulipas se concentra el mayor número de de pasos aduanales de México y Estados Unidos. Eso va, si México en general es la antesala, podemos decir que Tamaulipas puede ser la puerta de esa antesala que vincula a estos dos países. Por eso, mientras las circunstancias se mantengan como ahora, Tamaulipas va a ser la parte central del foco rojo. El problema de este proceso de lenta maduración es que de manera creciente va a ir vinculando a sectores sociales en las actividades delictivas. Y esto va a tener también efectos en la gobernabilidad de esas localidades, porque por ejemplo en Ciudad Mier, Tamaulipas, una ciudad que un día el 100% de los lugareños se fueron a dormir. ¿no? Al día siguiente, solo el 25-30% despertó en su cama. El 70% despertó en algún lugar de Estados Unidos o intentó trasladarse a algún otro lugar de México que le brindara la seguridad que ya no tenía en su localidad. Entonces tenemos ahí un efecto de cómo hay una especie de desaparición de la, lo, de la población local a raíz de esos conflictos, donde la migración, el control de la movilidad eh, de los residentes y de la gente de paso se ven afectadas. Para que la eficiencia de las redes de tráfico eh, de personas y de las redes criminales puedan tener eh, ese avance exitoso en sus actividades delictivas, tenemos que considerar 
qué es lo que hace o deja de hacer el gobierno o el Estado mexicano. Una de las acciones que son muy importantes es cómo el gobierno federal en los últimos 10 años ha modificado la actuación de sus dependencias federales o ha hecho algunos ajustes a sus marcos reglamentarios o de colaboración entre las distintas dependencias públicas. En ese sentido, lo que viene a hacer es una, eh, un reajuste en la participación de las policías municipales, del ejército, de la marina y de algunas otras autoridades vinculadas a seguridad pública que ante el señalamiento de que sus efectivos cometían violaciones de los derechos humanos para reducir ese número de violaciones, lo que hace es negar la participación ya de esos cuerpos eh, de gobierno en la labor auxiliar a la autoridad migratoria. Y lo que vamos a encontrar por otro lado es que también ante los señalamientos de que los albergues eran objeto de de infiltración por elementos de seguridad pública, el gobierno decide que no participen más esos agentes en actividades de infiltración, es decir, para preservar a los migrantes en esos lugares. Y en la administración del presidente Calderón, la, migración, la administración actual, se reduce la frecuencia de los operativos que se realizaban en las carreteras y en la red ferroviaria. ¿Cuáles son los resultados de esas disposiciones? En primer lugar, que se va a aumentar la porosidad institucional en la frontera sur. Segundo, es que va a haber un incremento en el tráfico de migrantes. Y una tercera, es que va a haber un decremento en el número de migrantes indocumentados que pasan por el país, hay un decremento en el número de las violaciones de los derechos humanos, pero va a haber un incremento en el total de las agresiones o ataques a los migrantes. ¿Cuál es el problema? El principal problema es que el gobierno mexicano no estaba preparado para una situación de esta naturaleza. Por un lado, no hacía trabajo de inteligencia en temas migratorios. Y segundo, por distintas disposiciones reglamentarias y por capacidades de actuación y por perspectivas, no había la suficiente coordinación entre migración con el CISEN, que es el área de inteligencia, y con el Ministerio Público Federal, que es la parte que investiga por el Poder Judicial. Es decir, el resultado es que vamos a encontrar una conjugación de distintas circunstancias y condiciones que van a favorecer no solo el incremento de las redes de tráfico, sino también de la colaboración entre las distintas redes. La, el problema es de que lo que necesitaba el Estado mexicano era perfeccionar su presencia en el tema migratorio y por otro lado, perfeccionar sus relaciones con la sociedad civil organizada. La estrategia no dio esos resultados. Lo que vamos a tener como un ejemplo de los efectos de esta situación es cómo los costos de la transmigración eh, se van a elevar por nacionalidad y vamos a ver cómo en el año 2009 al 2010, como lo ven en la pantalla, tenemos incrementos importantes que no solo van a beneficiar el tráfico de personas, sino también la trata, particularmente de aquellos que van a tener menos posibilidades de pagar en corto tiempo un monto tan alto como 70 mil dólares, eh, precios actualizados a, al día de hoy, ¿no? 
aquí tenemos 60 mil dólares para un chino en 2010, pero ahora ya estamos hablando en algunos sitios que se cobran 70 a 75 mil dólares. Y para pagar un monto así, se llegan a establecer acuerdos de pagar durante 10 o 15 años trabajando eh, para estas nacionalidades. ¿no? ¿Cuáles son los, los problemas? Yo eh, planteo que México en particular necesita tomar cinco disposiciones eh, que van desde el, cómo favorecer el marco legal de protección a los migrantes, cómo desestructurar las redes y la colaboración entre las redes desde los ámbitos locales, regionales e internacionales, la generación de bases de datos confiables que nos digan qué es lo que ocurre con la transmigración y las agresiones a los migrantes. Una cuarta, la necesaria correspondencia entre los presupuestos públicos destinados no solo a seguridad pública, sino también al desarrollo. Y por último, necesitamos que se generen instrumentos efectivos de colaboración regional para atender oportunamente las actividades delictivas que les he presentado en este momento. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Shang. Good morning. Um, first of all, yes, I'd like to thank um, Eric and Eric from uh, uh, Eric Squared, uh, from one from the Wilson Center, the other from ASU. Uh, and actually, more importantly, I want to thank uh, Gabriela, who actually got all of us connected, and uh, so uh, you can get to hear some diverse opinions and observations on human smuggling from Latin America to U.S. Um, this is the first time I've ever, uh, I've ever made a presentation in this place, so uh, I used to speak to uh, different audiences, um, uh, and therefore my approach is somewhat different from uh, Dr. Uh, Casillo. But we do have one thing in um, similarity, is that we all ob observed that in recent years, um, the overall um, volumes of uh, human smuggling activities from Mexico into U.S. Uh, has decreased somewhat. However, we see a greater increase in the mixture of different ethnic groups and racial groups. In other words, you have, now we see the Chinese snake hats. Well, by the way, uh, for those of you who, know, who don't know what snake hat is, uh, that's the term for, uh, that's the equivalent term of a coyotes in the Chinese context. Um, in China, we call the human smugglers the snake hats. Um, uh, we do see in recent years a greater uh, increase in collaborations between the Mexican coyotes and the Chinese snakeheads. And that is a phenomenon that has baffled me for some time, and I'm still struggling, uh, scrappling with this idea and how that is possible. Um, because for, I've been in the field for about 15 years in studying human smuggling activities, mostly in the, uh, in the Chinese context. And my field observations, as well as my uh, study of uh, prominent cases from Europe, from Asia, from any other places in, uh, in, in the world, is that the human smuggling is primarily an interracial phenomenon. In other words, the core smugglers are always of the same, not just the same racial group, but same ethnic group, and of the groups of people who share probably same dialects, probably even grew up in the same villages or same townships. Um, it, the, the format it takes on, the smuggling format it takes on, it serves a lot of very vital functions in the market environments. Okay, so let me back, backtrack a little bit and then explain why I think that is the case, and then I'll eventually end up with the same questions. Now, why is it that they, um, the different ethnic um, smugglers are able to overcome these back, um, barriers and to collaborate with each other, and even on a large scale? I'm sure most of you are probably aware of uh, back in January or February when uh, the Mexican authorities and caught a tractor trailers, two tractor trailers that came from um, Guatemala into um, a, a transit point in Chiapas and uh, there hundreds of illegal immigrants were uh, detained, uh, among which there were a lot of Chinese, a lot of Indians and Pakistanis. Um, such a large-scale collaboration is really baffling, so which also 
underlines my push or call for greater uh, field research to understand the mechanism and how they collaborate with each other. Okay, so snakeheads, human smuggling essentially, if you look at human smuggling, what is human smuggling? It's essentially an underground travel service. That's the end of it. So it, it, it exists solely in response to legal regulations of uh, um, uh, regulated uh, normal migration. So for people like you and me, we'll go to um, embassies and get a visa or uh, go to certain visa waiver countries and we just go there with our, uh, with our passports. But for these other people, who do not have the same resources, they have to rely on this underground travel service, you know, is essentially the coyotes and the snakeheads. And over the years, what I have seen from the Chinese context is that most snakeheads are from the same or very similar social network. In other words, it's a relatively small, close-knit network where people know each other very well, and they resemble sort of like a cartwheel with a node in the middle and connections with the different individuals who can bring forth vital resources. So in this case, people who are not related to that social network are usually have a difficult time. Even if they have resources, they're usually not brought in into the small group. Now, occasionally you can argue that they do utilize services from outside the group, you know, hiring a truck driver, a bus driver, or uh, someone to escort them through uh, the Sonoran Desert into the uh, U.S., and that's possible. But by and large, most smugglers work within a very close-knit social network. And the services that, that these individuals play or bring forth are fairly unique. Like, I know someone at a border crossing who uh, inspect the documents. So I know someone who can get the passport exit permits from the Chinese government. Um, and transactions are almost always dyadic, in other words, one-on-one, -on -one. so one person to the other. And I will tell you later on why that is the case. It serves two very vital functions. And the smuggling operations are mostly chain-like. In other words, one stage leads to the next recruitment, and the next stage, transportation, so on and so forth. So every stage is kind of like a dragon. You know, with every stage connect closely to each other. And this serial network relies heavily on the success of each individual stage in forwarding their clients. So in other words, any time if you have a breakdown, you can have a series of consequences. For instance, you know, the famous Golden Venture uh, incident back in 1993 in New York, Long Island, you have hundreds of immigrants <clears throat> came on the freighter on the open seas, but somehow the people who were supposed to drive those small speedboats and meet them on high seas and ferry them back to New York failed to show up. And um, about five or six years ago, uh, there's a boat landing in Ensenadas and unloaded about 130 or 40 Chinese immigrants. And uh, somehow the rendezvous person, the person that's supposed to come from Los Angeles going down to meet with these people, failed to show up for whatever reason. And you have a hundred some Chinese immigrants got stranded in Ensenada and not knowing anyone and not able to speak Spanish. And they went up and uh, after heading out for a few days and they were starving and thirsty so they started knocking on doors and these poor frightened Mexicans had no idea who these people were and where they came from started reporting it. And so these things happen every now and then. This is when these, ca these cases get blown up in the, in the news um, coverage. So this cartwheel network perspective, which I developed over the years, has worked quite well in explaining what I have been able to observe. And then later on, I'll tell you why this perspective is gradually unraveling and breaking apart now, because it's not um, suitable for explaining the current developments um, between Mexico and the U.S. So here what you're looking at, if you can see from the back, you have a client recruiters up in the front, then you have the document pr uh, producers and transportation coordinators. All these are, s are nodes along the process of smuggling activities. So every stage is vital. So every stage, any stage in that process, should it break down, the entire operation will break down. So that's why when you go overseas, if you ever get to travel overseas in Africa, Asia, Southeast Asia, and you will notice that there are actually a lot of people got stranded because their operations were not successful. They were not able, they were stuck in these places. You know, I once I made a trip in, uh, to northern Burma uh, studying cross-border drug trafficking, and I noticed that there were quite a few Chinese uh, immigrants 
were in these villages, and uh, this essentially no man's land, these little Chinese villages along the borders between Burma and Thailand, and I was wondering where they were from. And they told me that sh they were just stranded. They were supposed to continue their trip through Thailand, get some fraudulent passports, and go to Africa, and from Africa to come to uh, Latin America. So the transportation rules are quite elaborate, but somehow the process broke down in, th uh, in Burma, and they were stranded in those villages, and they were waiting to be forwarded. <coughs> Okay, so what are some of the market constraints that force the operations into a very interracial, interethnic group operations? First of all, you have law enforcement interference, of course. On the U.S., from China, the governments are all actively cracking down on human smuggling, on these unregulated uh, uh, migration process. And you have a limited clientele. Now, this might be counterintuitive, but if you think if the smugglers are charging the, the migrants 60 or 70 some thousand dollars to come to the U.S. Not that many people can qualify for such a high fee. <clears throat> so clients are actually limited. You have to prove your financial world with us before you can qualify to be smuggled. So you have a lot of people in China, that's true, but not that many can qualify to be smuggled to the U.S. And operational complexity. The operations of sending people, getting people out of China into Southeast Asia, from Southeast Asia to Africa, to Latin America, into Mexico, into U.S., is quite complex. And also, the operations tend to be hazardous and uncertain in outcome. You never know which stage may break down. So the entire operation is somewhat quite uncertain in terms of outcome. And the operation is quite sporadic in terms of opportunities. So they don't always exist. You know, once you have a family, you know, China has the one-child policy. Even if you break that law, have two or three kids, after you smuggle all the three kids to the U.S., and that's the end of the clients, unlike any other most traditional organized crime in terms of gambling, uh, uh, drug trafficking, prostitution, you have sort of an unlimited source of a client. So as long as you have a client, you can continue the business, but not with human smuggling. After you work through a family, that's the end of the, uh, your, your clients, and you have to develop additional ones, and it actually takes quite a bit of effort to develop new clients. You're talking about having someone entrust you with their family members and another 60 or 70 grants to do this illegal activities. So the opportunities are actually not that abundant, and this is sporadic. And snake hats do not always have resources themselves, so they oftentimes serve as the brokers. And this is the area, it's unlike the open business, where you don't have, you know, you go to a store, you want to buy something, and the store doesn't have it, and the store owner probably will refer you down the street, a couple of stores down, you can buy it from there. Not with illegal activities. Illicit enterprises is always marked by people who are trying to occupy a brokerage position. Now, it is important because that guarantees you profit. The key with a broker is that it takes a position of asymmetrical Resources. You cut in, the between, cut in the middle between clients who want to purchase the service and those who have the resources, or those who have the services to provide. And in between, you serve as a mediator going through you, and a profit can be generated. So profits are possible. I've got three minutes, I'll rush. Profits are possible as long as asymmetries are maintained. And this is a crude explanation on why human smuggling is almost always, in the Chinese context at least, is almost always one-on-one -on -one transactions. And the research from other fields, like Carlo uh, Morselli and the University of Montreal and other researchers around the world have done researches on other things like stolen cars, um, contraband products, and realized that, that the brokers play a very crucial uh, role in this um, uh, the field. Um, now, very quickly, going through this dyadic network perspectives, why that is the case. First of all, in an illicit content, uh, enterprise environments, only spoken ag agreements can be reached. In other words, these agreements are not legally enforceable, nor legally protected. And therefore, one-on-one -on -one relationship promotes understanding, increase shared expectations, a mutual understanding. So, so you know what I need, right? Yes, I need a passport on a certain days. Can you provide? So it increases the mutual understanding, shared expectations. And therefore, a satisfying trading atmosphere can be achieved. After all, this is a business. 
And a certain levels of satisfaction, whether it be at transactions or eventual profits, has to be realized in order for this business to sustain itself. And because smuggling or transportation routes are often complex and treacherous, each stage relies heavily on the successful operation of the previous stage. Operational clarity and efficiency can be achieved. This is illegal activities after all. So with one-on-one -on -one transactions, you reduce the communication to the shortest points, one-on-one, -on -one, two points. And the small interactions, therefore, improves communication. And such interactions also expedite decision-making. You don't go through third person, another person. You don't go through a committee or a board to make a decisions. And each cluster of individuals, like this cartwheel, focus on one task and one task only. So it increases operational efficiency. So between the, between the efficiency, another factor is also the transactional security. Now keep in mind, if you're working with one-on-one, -on -one, the two things can be achieved, can be guaranteed. One is profit. You, only you, can provide the service. Doesn't matter where you get the products. This person who wants it has to go through you. So you guarantee the profit, and you cut out any unscrupulous um, uh, businessman or middleman, someone who can defraud you. And the second, it increases or guarantees your operational security. No one else knows what your agreement is. So minimize your exposure to law enforcement interactions. But this theory works so far and within the Chinese context, but how do you explain now in recent years what I have observed and also reported in the news media, there's a greater collaborations between the Mexican coyotes and the Chinese snakeheads. There's no systematic empirical research to start with, and I haven't done any work and I haven't seen anyone else have done the work to, emphasize, to study how is it that the Chinese snakeheads can overcome all these market constraints and cultural imperatives to work with the Mexican coyotes. How do you overcome, for instance, the trust issue, the confidence issue? How can I trust my clients whom I'm going to re realize a lot of profits in your hands? What if you fail? So these things have not been resolved. And, 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 and because the lack of a mutual cultural context, linguistic, uh, linguistic or cultural uh, shared understandings, Cross-cultural collaborations in the illegal enterprise and in the illegal context is quite difficult. What I don't understand is, is how these people are able to overcome, because the fact that their agreements are not legally recognized nor protected, and this is one area, and I really want to push for a more research for, for those of you who are either doing your PhDs or in the policy making or decision making positions and hopefully can promote such an understanding so that um, people like me and uh, Dr. Garcia can launch some projects and uh, find out why that is the case. So we can speculate all we want, but we do really need to get in the field again and observe and talk to these smugglers and the snakeheads and ask them, how can you do it? Why is that possible? Thank you. Sorry, I went over my time. No problem. Thank you. Well, thank you everybody, first of all, for being here. Buenos dias a todos. And thank you very much to our panel and to both Eric and Eric as well. Um, muchas gracias a todos por acompañarnos. Move this over here. My name is Gabriela Sanchez, and I'm a senior researcher at START. We are uh, with the University of Maryland. And um, just to, you know, um, wrap up some of these ideas that we have been discussing this morning on human smuggling, I'm going to tell you about my research on human smugglers in the southwest, particularly in Arizona, in Maricopa County. Um, that's um, the Phoenix metropolitan area. There it is. Well, we have a series of um, trends um, as far as undocumented immigration um, stands at this point. We are seeing that the arrests of undocumented immigrants are, in a sense, decreasing. Um, when I say, when I talk about this decrease, I also think about um, this morning's um, news uh, when Secretary Napolitano reported that uh, we are on track to reach, um, to break a record this year on the number of deportations, um, which is reflecting the record number of arrests under this in the current administration. At the same time, we have a growing number of the cases involving the kidnappings of undocumented immigrants. 
Um, but again, as both um, Dr. Casillas and Dr. Shang uh, mentioned, um, there's a lot of speculation. We really don't know what's going out there in the field. We haven't had a chance to talk to as many smugglers as we would like. So um, I've been studying um, human smuggling for several years, um, in at the and but I was also part of criminal investigations in Arizona on human smuggling. And at that point, it was very surprising to me um, to find almost no research um, conducted on the issue of human smuggling. And that's when I um, you know, decided to start um, this specific project. Um, when I started my objective was pretty much to identify, collect, and synthesize empirical data on the smuggling groups in Arizona. And this was m mostly, again, because of all of these references and all the information that was circulating out there, that there had to be some sort of um, connection between organized crime and smuggling. Um, it was also an attempt to map the social organization of smuggling groups. We knew that coyotes, as they are um, known along the U.S.-Mexico border, uh, were operating, but we really didn't have that much information on how they were doing that. Why did I choose Arizona? Why did we pick Arizona? Well, Arizona has become the main point of entry for undocumented immigrants from Mexico, Latin America. Um, it's um, also the main point of entry for um, illicit substances in the country. And there's a very um, clear presence of other organized crime groups in the region. So um, this study in particular um, looks into the social organization of human smuggling. And it involves interviews conducted with 66 individuals convicted for human smuggling in Maricopa County up to um, 20, um, last year, it's 2010. It's mostly a qualitative study uh, involving legal case files analysis, and this was built in pre-sentence reports, which includes uh, personal interviews with human smugglers, um, police reports that were documented during the arrests of these um, individuals, and also some um, the analysis of some wiretap transcripts that were available um, through um, open records. Um, this also um, builds on interviews conducted with former smugglers, their families, and their clients. But once again, the study's um, main focus was on the human smugglers and not the customers. Um, and it also involves field visits to smuggling communities along border towns and also um, some of the communities where these smugglers are conducting their recruiting activities. So, you know, this is some of the, um, these are some of the facts. This, uh, this is what we know about smugglers at this point, the ones operating in Arizona. They are predominantly males. Mm -hmm. That was in the sample of 66, we are talking about 82%. Most of them are married, and he had a mixed status household. Um, by mixed status household, I um, mean um, families that, were, that are constituted by both um, US citizens um, and undocumented residents. Um, the average age uh, is 29 for males, 27 for females. And the majority of um, human smugglers are actually employed full-time in service occupations in Arizona, where the average salary is about $250 per week. Most of them are undocumented immigrants. And you know, one fact where we can actually connect all of our presentations, they are primarily of Mexican origin, followed by Cuban uh, organizations, or Cuban citizens, I should say. But let's talk about how people enter into smuggling. Um, and again, here I um, echo about the, the findings about Dr. Casillas and Dr. Shang in the sense that these are very close networks, or at least used to be very close networks, where um, entry into smuggling was um, conditioned to friends and family primarily. Um, I had to trust you, I had to know you, I had to have a very clear relationship or connection with you so that you could enter in my network. However, one of the changes that, uh, that we've noticed over the last few years, and I would say about five or six years, as Dr. Casillas pointed out, is that there's a new form of recruitment, the sudden recruitment, or the, while it's sudden, it's also systematic recruitment um, of undocumented immigrants to provide services. So let's say that I just hired a smuggler to come into the country, and I can't afford the last payment. I'm $500 short, so the smuggler, um, works out an agreement with the customer so that they can, um, they would tell him, well, I'll let you, you won't have to pay me the $500 you owe me if you help me out or if you drive or if you watch this group of people while I go and get a car. And I think this is one of the reasons why the, um, this is one of the indicators in a morphing market where 
the, the alliances and the loyalties are no longer there. The um, protections that could have been in place in the past to protect immigrants are vanishing. Um, another finding of um, this study is that there's no central hierarchy in smuggling. It was uh, primarily conformed by independent providers working in collaboration with friends and family. At the same time, smuggling has very limited career prospects. Um, we are only talking about occasional, sporadic um, opportunities for, for employment. That was one of the main reasons why people kept their regular jobs while they were um, working as part of a smuggling organization. Another finding is that while there's a definite financial interest of participating in smuggling, a lot of people do it for, um, or they think of smuggling as an access, as an avenue to acquire a higher social status. Uh, we have to keep in mind that some of the earnings that come from smuggling are from 50 to $100 per person, and that this income is, never, is not going to guarantee you any kind of social mobility. Uh, however, if I'm a good smuggler, if I'm a good coordinator, if I'm, a, if I'm good at driving, and I'm, good at, um, I'm very good at um, accessing all of these resources that are needed for a smuggling um, um, project, mm -hmm. I am going to have a, a I'm going to be very well known in my community. Mm -hmm. There's going to be this recognition of uh, uh, my actions as a coordinator, as a smuggler, and I may have better access to improved resources and improved connections. In terms of um, smuggling as a business, there's really no large investments required. The notion that um, organized um, smuggling um, depends on this massive investments of cash or of people bringing in or being highly coordinated at um, developing their, their networks. I, I couldn't find any evidence of that. There's really no large investments required and there's uh, very high reliance on um, resources that are already available. Um, if you have a working car, mm -hmm, you, you know, or, or if you have a house, if you have access to an apartment where you can house undocumented immigrants for a couple days, there's really no, um, no larger investment than that. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, uh, the income generated based on um, a person's role in smuggling ranges from $50, in the case of um, primarily women who go and cash the wire transfers, um, to about $150 for a person um, smuggled per um, a driver, for example, a, a driver um, who was um, covering the route from Phoenix to um, Tennessee was probably earning about $180, $150 per person transported. What, one of the implications of this very low um, profit um, is that, like I also mentioned earlier, a very um, small possibility of having any kind of social mobility. Most operators are recirculating their earnings in the local economy. So the, the notion of uh, very large profits uh, being shifted out to Mexico was not the case in the, in among this kind of uh, networks. Um, most of the earnings were immediately spent on rent, um, paying for, for housing, um, childcare expenses, uh, it, medical expenses as well. So when it comes to social or the social organization of smuggling, which is you know the main um, topic of this presentation, we are talking about individuals being in charge of very specific segments of the operation. They don't really identify themselves as being part of a larger group. There is a high degree of differenci differentiation, um, which means that there is, um, if I'm a driver, I am not going to be coordinating the, um, the entire operation. All I'm going to do is to drive people from point A to point B. If I'm cashing checks, that's all I'm going to be doing. There's really no, there's not a really, uh, there, there's no career path for most of the smuggling providers. The income generated um, in because of the, through participation of smuggling is primarily based on the the kind of the nature of the activity. And I think this at the same time, this level of differentiation and. Um, the distribution of uh, tasking, you know, tasks and the smuggling has decreased individual profits. While a, op a smuggler operating on his or her own in the past could have, um, could have kept most of the fee, 
Now, this person is having to distribute it among, you know, anywhere from four to 15 people. So that even, that definitely lowers the profits or the potential for profits in the smuggling operation. These are some of the roles, and these are not, um, they, they are, um, these are the most prevalent roles in the smuggling. Um, as we, um, so earlier on uh, the, uh, our prior presentations, we are talking about uh, recruiters who operate locally and abroad. It means people who are, who live the, within the U.S. and who reach out to their friends and family in Mexico. At the same time, we also have uh, recruiters who travel back into their countries to recruit, to actually be actively recruit undocumented immigrants who are likely, they are very, uh, they are screened, who are likely to come up with the fees or to cover their smuggling fees. On the border, we have caminadores or walkers and helpers who do work, who cover the routes from the border to a meeting point where they are met by the drivers and or their co-pilots. Um, these drivers then and will take the staff or will, will actually drive the undocumented immigrants uh, to safe houses. And these are uh, located predominantly in the Phoenix area. And within the um, safe houses, we have a very high, again, we, we do, again, have a very high differentiation of um, staff. We have cooks, we have cleaners, we have guards, people who are uh, performing very specific activities. We have the coordinators who run and make sure that all of the, all of the operations um, are kept in place. And coordinators are usually permanent residents or, or citizens who have been in the, in the country for a very long period of time and who have a lot of extremely, uh, they, who are extremely well connected within their communities. And again, they are not coordinators who not only facilitate smuggling services, they may also be able to put in touch families um, with um, doctors in the event of an arrest, they have uh, access to um, legal counsel. Thank you. Mm. Let's see. Gonna um, rush through this couple, no, that's a couple of slides. Slides. Um, and here we are looking into the smuggling and organized crime connection. There's really no evidence that will, uh, uh, you know, as far as that, as this sample is um, um, involved. There's no indication or evidence of collaboration among criminal groups in non-smuggling and ac smuggling activities. Um, for you know as many reports as we have on the involvement of organized crime in smuggling, there were only two references in my sample to um, any form of organized crime. One was uh, someone who, you know, just a passing comment, mentioned the mafia, in a reference to Los Señores in Nogales. Um, but it looked, among the smugglers, there's really no true interest in participating in other activities that, while more profitable, will actually increase the risk of prosecution this is especially the case of uh, families with children. Um, there's also no evidence that involvement in other markets is a pathway to human smuggling. And there is no indication that there are ties to drug trafficking organizations in this group. What are the limitations of you know, this study as well? Well, this is basically exploratory. And we're only, we, oh, I was only able to um, conduct you know, the sample size is only 66 uh, smugglers. Um, but they are, and they are primarily nonviolent, and we can talk later on during the Q&A about those cases involving violence. And as um, Eric one right here mentioned earlier, why should we care? Why should we care about um, human smuggling in the Southwest, and for that reason, just along the Mexico border, in, in other, you know, throughout the world, throughout borders around the world? Um, I think we are in the middle of a transition. I think we're witnesses drastic changes, dramatic changes within the smuggling markets and the organizations. And we are actually witnessing a uh, metamorphosis of other organized groups and of transnational criminal organizations venturing into other new markets. And, you know, uh, we are, there's also these concerns over human and national security and, of course, human rights, um, which, are, which have to be a central part of our discussion in um, human smuggling as well. Thank you so much. Okay, to uh, kick off our kind of question and dialogue period, we've asked Eric Lee to make a few comments and, and maybe raise a question or two. And Yeah, you can sure. do it from right there if you'd like, Great. and then we'll turn to the audience. 
Fantastic. Okay. Well, thanks. First of all, thanks very much uh, yet again to uh, uh, Eric Olson and uh, Andrew Seeley for the invitation to uh, bring the panel here to uh, to Washington. Um, the North American Center for Transporter Studies is, is based at Arizona State University. Arizona State is in Tempe. University of Arizona is in Tucson. Um, uh, it's a big difference, uh, as all Arizonans know. Um, and uh, we are a public policy center. We look at this through the frame of, of, of public policy. So that is, uh, I think, one of the reasons why I was asked to uh, ask to comment. Um, uh, the other reason, I think, is that I am uh, currently heading up a project that looks at human trafficking legislation in Mexico and the United States, particularly at the state level, the six uh, in the six uh, border states uh, in Mexico, as well as the Western United States. Working on this with a number of stakeholders, including the Border Governors Conference, the Border Legislative Conference, and the Conference of Western Attorneys General. It's a really interesting project. Uh, we hope to uh, roll it out here in Washington uh, sometime over the next uh, uh, couple of months. Uh, so again, I'm looking at trafficking. Uh, while these presentations were uh, mostly mostly on smuggling, uh, the difference, we could have a day-long conference on the uh, definitions uh, here, but uh, smuggling involves some degree of consent, and uh, trafficking involves uh, uh, in, in broad terms, force, fraud, or coercion. There's a point at w it's very confusing. There's a point at which they uh, intersect, uh, but we think of them as uh, separate separate phenomena. Um, what stands out? These were very very rich presentations. Uh, uh, what stands out uh, in these presentations for me? I think the fragility of all of this uh, is quite striking. The fragility, uh, first of all, of the government uh, uh, institutional framework in Mexico. Um, as well as the U.S. Uh, that uh, Rodolfo clearly uh, spelled out, as well as the fragility of these organizations. Uh, it is a really, um, uh, I, and, I, and I think this has real uh, policy implications for folks uh, working on this in the law enforcement community, working on this in both the U.S. Uh, and Mexico. Uh, Sheldon's presentation showed the uh, uh, the ways that this could easily break down along the different points uh, uh, of, uh, of, of, uh, of 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 the chain. Uh, and Gabriela uh, made the point that this is not a great way uh, to make a living. This is there's not a lot of money at the in this business at the operational level. Now, to ant possibly anticipate a question from the audience, I think you uh, both of you were mostly looking at. Um, uh, folks at the operational level uh, in these organizations. I, I, my question would be, what kind of money uh, is there at the uh, uh, middle management to upper management and, and kind of CEO, le CEO levels of these organizations, or do those even exist? Uh, where is all that money going that uh, Rodolfo uh, pointed out at the, uh, during his presentation? Um, and also that we're, we're at a point of transition uh, in Mexico. We have, uh, the Mexican government has had uh, uh, President Calderon has made uh, the fight against organized crime a centerpiece of his presidency. He will be remembered for that uh, in history, clearly. And, uh, and this is, uh, uh, you have a very difficult situation uh, in a security situation in a number of points in Mexico, not in the entire country, but a number of key points, Tamaulipas, Ciudad Juarez, uh, uh, stand out. Um, just kind of going through the presentations as uh, quickly as possible here, uh, from from Adolfo's presentation, I think what what comes out clearly to me is that it will be difficult for the U.S. and Mexico. Well, first of all, uh, our center doesn't think that the U.S. can legislate ourselves out of these unilaterally out of these issues of human mobility uh, in in the Americas. This we share a two thousand mile long border with Mexico uh, that is uh, difficult, if not impossible, to manage. Uh, uh, well, we're getting closer. Uh, but uh, if, the, if the policy pieces, the institutional pieces are not in place in Mexico, uh, if the U.S. tomorrow said, okay, let's have comprehensive immigration reform, would Mexico be ready uh, to work with the U.S. Uh, uh, in some kind of uh, agreement or system of, of human mobility? I, I don't think so. I don't think Mexico is ready, and I think that came out uh, in Rodolfo's presentation. Also, uh, the federal-state interface in Mexico is very, very difficult. If we think it's difficult in the United States, it's maybe orders of magnitude more difficult uh, in Mexico. Um, 
on a recent uh, uh, trip to uh, outreach trip to Tamaulipas that we did with the Border Legislative Conference, uh, uh, it was quite interesting to hear the response of people in state government there. They've, uh, the state government has created a state migration institute now uh, to look at the issue of, uh, of migration uh, through Tamaulipas. I think there's a lot of sentiment against migration, trans migrants right now in the state of Tamaulipas. And uh, as one state official there put it, uh, after all, they are in the country uh, illegally. Uh, and for a second there, I thought I was back in Maricopa County. Uh, uh, it was uh, in, uh, very interesting to hear. Um, now, on the trafficking side, I think, uh, just to jump ahead a little bit, I think we have, a, with all of the recent uh, legislative changes in Mexico on human trafficking, uh, we have a good opportunity to have uh, some very positive collaboration between the U.S., uh, uh, and Mexico, but that's that's on that's on the trafficking side. Um, uh, the uh, it, and also what stood out uh, very clearly from uh, Rodolfo's presentation is the fact that uh, what made the situation worse in Mexico is when the government agencies pulled back. Uh, there, 2000, uh, 2008, 2009, as a result of all of the human rights violations that, uh, that they were being uh, accused of. Uh, a very interesting policy response um, and uh, a really tragic outcome uh, there for, uh, for Mexico. Um, in terms of uh, what, uh, what stood out from uh, uh, Sheldon's presentation. I think the operational complexity of these organizations is, uh, is uh, quite interesting. They're very fragile. They're very uh, asymmetric. There's a lot of asymmetries. You have a very unstable situation, and I think that, uh, that is something for policymakers and, and folks in the policy shops and the different law enforcement agencies uh, to really think about. Uh, Gabriela is, uh, uh, lives in Arizona, as I do. Um, well, that's one of the places you live. You're off to, uh, off to uh, 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 another life here soon. Um, Arizona has become the main point of entry from Mexico, and that is uh, uh, at least uh, partly the result of U.S. government policy with Operation Gatekeeper in San Diego, a hold the line there uh, that were implemented uh, fairly effectively in the early to mid-1990s. Arizona, which had formerly been a very sleepy uh, immigration corridor there, uh, became extremely active. Also, you have the expansion of the Phoenix economy there in the late 1990s that created a ton of, uh, of, of jobs in construction and the hospitality industry that pulled those uh, uh, migrants in just uh, in a very, very impressive uh, manner. Um, uh, I think uh, possibly... Uh, the most uh, interesting, uh, uh, these, again, these presentations were really fascinating to me, but one of the most interesting findings uh, from, this, uh, from Gabriela's uh, initial research is that she doesn't find any ties to drug trafficking uh, uh, organizations, transnational criminal organizations, and that, I think, should be the basis of, uh, uh, that could form a really good basis for uh, our discussion here. Great, thank you. I'm going to give the panelists a chance to think about uh, additional comments they want to make, but I also want to turn to the audience and maybe take two or three questions uh, uh, before I turn back to the panelists. Um, Alex over here has got a microphone. We have people uh, joining us on the web, so please uh, use the microphone to ask your question, identify yourself. Are there any hands? There's a gentleman here. Uh, Alex, be right up back there. Do you have one, Allison? Do you want to pass it over? Hello? Sorry, I think Alex is going to. Um, my name is uh, John Lyle. I, I'm a contractor at the Department of State and the Bureau of International Narcotics. Um, one of the other connections between um, Mexico and East Asia is, um, is drugs. Uh, in particular, uh, the precursors, the, uh, the chemicals that you need to make methamphetamine, they're predominantly, well, the two largest exporters of those chemicals are China and uh, India. India overwhelmingly in the interim, but China significant as well. There are others. Um, so uh, I think, uh, you know, with these two flows and connections, uh, 
you wonder in, in that particular case uh, whether perhaps there's uh, some, uh, I mean, they need each other. In the, uh, the, the smuggler, uh, the, 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 the snakehead in China, for that last, uh, I don't know how many miles uh, in the desert there, he needs the, the, uh, the coyote. He's got to find him. Um, on the other hand, uh, the, the Mexican market needs these precursors to serve the methamphetamine market in the United States. And they're coming uh, largely from India and, and, uh, and China. So there's these natural flows. And I wondered um, whether or not in that particular case, you know, uh, Ms. Sanchez's uh, research has demonstrated that there's uh, the DTO connection and the, and the smuggler connection is, is not there. So, but in this case, might there be? Just a, that question. Yeah. The connection, in that sense, um, the connection between, did they find each other through drugs or somehow? Right. There was a question all the way in the back. Hi, uh, Adriana with Talk Radio News Service. Um, I wanted to ask about Operation Fast and Furious. Um, it's been in the news a lot. It's clearly something, I mean, it's, it's outstanding that that happened, that the, the U.S. government allowed that to happen. And I want to see if you guys have done any research on that or have any information and maybe more on the role of the U.S. government in the violence um, that immigrants face passing through Mexico and in organized crime. And if there's anything that the two governments could do to work together, um, what you think? What was the U.S. operation I didn't hear? Fast and Furious. Oh, that's an arms smuggling. Uh, right. Yeah, okay. I don't know that our panelists have focused on arms smuggling. They've focused on human. So, I mean, uh, there's one more question here. Now we'll come back. We'll get another round. So. Good morning. Thank you for your presentations. I'm Jessica Morris from the Department of Justice. This question is specifically for Rodolfo, but please, anyone else, um, uh, can chime in. Um, I've observed in our uh, investigations and, and just reading media reports that uh, most extracontinental migrants coming um, to the United States through Mexico enter through Guatemala. How important do you think um, Guatemala is in, from Mexico's perspective in addressing uh, migration issues, um, irregular migration issues? Um, and what is the state of that dialogue between Mexico and Guatemala, and what are the barriers to, to furthering that, that dialogue? Okay, why don't we uh, start with Rodolfo and work down, and you're welcome to comment on, on Eric Lee's points or some of the questions, so. Muchas gracias por los comentarios, Eric, y por sus preguntas. Ten, tenemos información de que eh, los Zetas en particular cobran 600 dólares por cada eh, transmigrante que ellos van a proteger durante su trayecto en México. Si nosotros consideramos el ejemplo que mencionaba Sheldon de 513 migrantes que fueron detectados en dos trailers en mayo de este año, 513 migrantes que cada uno de ellos pagó 7 mil dólares y de esos 600 dólares iban para Zetas, pueden sacar un monto de cuánto solo en ese traslado ellos iban a ganar. Ciertamente la, la cooperación eh, internacional es importante cuando yo les estaba mencionando la habilidad de las redes de tráfico para encontrar países de paso cuya normatividad migratoria es flexible y que les va a permitir el paso legal por países intermedios antes de llegar a la zona caliente en términos migratorios, como va a ser la antesala mexicana y después el paso a Estados Unidos. Es muy importante en ese sentido la colaboración no solo bilateral, sino multilateral para que se encuentren fórmulas eh, en materia migratoria que obstaculice 
o dificulte la posibilidad de la utilización de países de paso en este proceso transmigratorio eh, mundial. ¿no? Nosotros tenemos que hacer una diferenciación eh, técnica entre lo que son las redes que trafican drogas con las redes que trafican personas, porque aunque ambos hablan de mercancía, son distintas mercancías, en, usando su lenguaje, son distintos nichos de mercado delictivo. En ese sentido, eh, tenemos que ver que así como hay la especialidad de las redes que se dedican solo a las drogas en el caso mexicano, como los cárteles, el, el de Tijuana, el del Golfo, el de, Tijuana, el de Sinaloa, la familia michoacana, en fin. Tenemos la organización Zetas, que es una red de redes delictivas que incursiona en cualquier tipo de actividad a diferencia de los cárteles tradicionales. En ese sentido, los Zetas son los únicos que se han apropiado prácticamente del nuevo nicho de mercado que es la transmigración. ¿no? Y eso quizás ayude un poco a responder su pregunta, aunque mi compañera de mesa, Gabriela, pueda ampliar su respuesta. En el caso de la operación Rápido y Furioso, rápidamente una idea, eh, la versión en el tema migratorio es que por los contactos que nosotros hemos desarrollado en trabajo de campo, eh, sabemos que hay eh, jefes de las redes de tráfico que tranquilamente residen en Texas y que sus conexiones en Tapachula, en la frontera México con Guatemala, les llaman por teléfono y les dicen, ya estoy con el cargamento aquí en la frontera, podemos pasar. Y desde Texas les dan la instrucción de decirles, esta semana sí, esta semana no, o véganse por el, la ruta X. ¿no? Y desde Texas tranquilamente los están monitoreando y sabemos que los escuchas más o menos oficiales pueden estar enterados de que esto ocurre. Es un tema de investigación. ¿no? El caso de, de los eh, asiáticos y africanos que de manera legal llegan a Guatemala, eh, particularmente los indios, ¿no? para después llegar a residir en algunos lugares de Texas, nuevamente vuelvo al Texas, y el ICE sabe perfectamente esto porque tiene hasta los mapas del lugar de origen en la India, cómo llegan a Guatemala, cómo pasan por México y dónde viven en Texas. Eso está perfectamente mapeado. Eh, es una realidad que invita a que los gobiernos de Estados Unidos, México y Guatemala, en este caso específico, tengan un acuerdo. Uno de los grandes problemas que tiene Guatemala es su larga trayectoria de corrupción, de la facilidad de comprar incluso el pasaporte eh, en la India, como guatemalteco, para no hablar de las fisuras operativas con los agentes de a pie. Estoy hablando de viejas prácticas de corrupción que involucran a altos niveles de la Cancillería guatemalteca y no solo a la Dirección eh, de Asuntos Migratorios de Guatemala, que también tiene su trayectoria en la facilidad de dar eh, apoyos para que el flujo ocurra. México y Guatemala tienen una serie de, de convenios eh, muchísimos convenios para la colaboración en materia de seguridad, de comercio, de fronteras, de ríos, eh, que eh, sería apabullante leer el listado. Por eso hablo de que debieran eh, generarse instrumentos efectivos, y quisiera recalcar la palabra efectivos, que ayudaran a la labor de prevención y de atención a estos flujos transmigratorios. Gracias. Sheldon, or Gabriela. Um, I guess uh, um, uh, to synthesize all the questions, there's, there's a, this overlapping theme in that uh, whether there are collaborations between uh, uh, armed smugglers and drug traffickers and the human smugglers and how they collaborate with each other. 
Um, from my field work and from what I've read, um, although it has been widely speculated that uh, the human smugglers may also transport uh, chemical precursors uh, and synthetic drugs uh, across the borders, um, I have not found any uh, concrete evidence to substantiate such, uh, such connections. But it's not impossible, it is likely. Um, but from a conceptual point of view, I, I think it's somewhat difficult to, uh, to uh, uh, put all these so-called contrabands uh, together. I mean, humans are different from other types of contraband things, you know, either it be firearms or synthetic drugs or cocaine or whatever you said. If you lose a load of uh, cocaine or marijuana, and so be it, you can cut the loss and do it again, hopefully you can make up your money. And that is not the case with human beings. Um, from the point of view of the families as well as the smugglers. So there's a lot of responsibility. And the smuggling human beings also involve a lot more logistics than just drugs. With drugs, it's mostly an issue of concealment, you know, whether you can hide the drugs properly, and uh, whether it's in a gas tank or uh, the, in between the engines and the compartments. But with the human beings, it's a lot more difficult. You know, if you're going in there, they have to eat, they have to go to the bathroom, they have to sleep, and you have to find all these logistics, and not to mention um, the liability and, and the family concerns along the way. Um, so what I have found over the years is that the human smugglers are fairly specialized uh, enterprise, and there's not been very much. There's not been much overlapping um, between the human smugglers and drug traffickers. Um, and you know, I'm trying to answer as many questions as possible. Um, the fact that there's no connection, there's no indication of that connection in the sample does not mean that these interactions are not taking place. I think all organizations are very aware of what's going on in their surroundings, and the uh, matter of um, success is based on that awareness and that understanding of those very implicit and, and um, unspoken agreements that are, are out there in regards to who is using what resources at what specific time. Um, so, but, but I think it is also very, what, um, what I really like about our presentations is how they are, we are talking about groups that are, or that were at different stages. Like, um, you know, we can talk about the case of the um, Chinese smugglers. And, um, when, and you know, I, I agree with the fact that there's very, very um, our, the evidence that is related to um, that potential connection on you know, drug, human, um, and weapon smuggling is um, very um, flimsy. It's slow. I think I do not think that we have enough evidence to go with that. However, that is only you know that doesn't mean that all markets are going to be the same or that all the all of the groups are going to be operating in um, um, in, the, in similar fashion as uh, we have uh, realized in the case of Losetas. Um, where I, you know, in, and I'm very glad that um, Dr. Casillas wrote this up, the fact that they are a red de redes, mm -hmm. it's a network of networks, um, instead of just thinking, and, and we tend to do that, and I think that is one, uh, one of our, um, one challenge that, you know, that has to be overcome, the way on how we have come to think about um, transnational and criminal organizations, and criminal organizations in general, as um, these blocks, when they are in fact composed by multiple people, multiple organizations, and um, individuals who may have um, different goals as well. Great, we're, we're low on time, so I'll take two more, but make them quick questions. There was one right here that I promised to come to. Uh, go right here, Alex, and then Allison, if you would take this young woman here. Scott Clendenin, uh, Coast Guard Fellow at Brookings. Uh, just, uh, Curious uh, from all your interviews and, and discussions, uh, what percentage of these uh, operate or the smuggling operations are successful and actually get through? What's their perception of risk? And also for third party nationals, uh, for example, the snakehead involvement, um, because they're paying more, do they generally uh, link with more successful smugglers? Mm -hmm. you want to take that? Go ahead. My name is Maria. I'm doing an internship in the Mexico's embassy, and I would like to know your opinion, or yes, considering human smuggling as an international issue, what kind of measures should Central American countries and also the United States adopt to attack the problem? 
and to Rodolfo. Um, do you think that there's a relation between visa restrictions and the uh, mm, uh, human smuggling? I mean, if there are more visa restrictions, there's going to be more human smuggling. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Go ahead. Let me um, start by answering your question in terms of um, success. The cases that we have, the cases that we're able to uh, prosecute ultimately are unsuccessful, unsuccessful cases, right? Um, and, actually, and the number of undocumented immigrants present, in not only in the U.S., but I would say that in any country, it's a very clear indication of how successful these networks are. Those are only the smugglers that, are, uh, that we detect. They are only the cases that we're able to, uh, um, to prosecute in our courts. And uh, we also have to think on the community factor and on how um, the smugglers are very, especially very successful smugglers, are being very well, um, they are very uh, well guarded secrets by the communities. The communities are going to protect them, the communities are going to go and reach out to them whenever um, they have a, a need for travel. Um, so I think, you know, um, most of the stories that we get to hear in media are the tragic stories, um, you know, when, um, Immigrants are unfortunate to die uh, when uh, operations or when someone uh, are fail, when someone is, um, uh, forgets <laughs> to um, to go and pick up a group, um, or you know the the most tragic cases like the one in San Fernando, or the ones that are very common along the um, North Africa um, in Spain crossings of um, sub-Saharan immigrants, migrants. Um, but I think that is also a very good indication of how successful, once again, the, most of these groups are. Um, that's true, very much in line with what Gabriela says. Um, uh, I, I would say the majority of the operations are quite successful. Um, otherwise, for those of you who ever take long drives through the heartlands of America, um, every few years just drive through and count how many Chinese restaurants emerged along the way. And you can tell, and I can guarantee you, uh, the kitchens are almost always staffed by undocumented migrants. You know, that's why you're able to buy Chinese food at such a low price. Um, if you have me wash dishes and chop vegetables, uh, the price will not be that low. Um, so, so the majority of the smuggling operations are quite successful. Um, yes, the ones you heard through the news stories and the caught and on the on the Custom Border Patrol websites, you know, posted all these uh, uh, um, cases. Those are the unfortunate ones, um, but they're, they're. I would say. Just do a random guess. I mean, if, based on the interviews I've had, uh, I would say at least a 90 to 95 percent of the time, said the operations went smoothly and uneventfully. So you don't hear anything. That's why I see. I mean, all you notice is all the restaurants, the Chinese restaurants, start emerging now. So, um, um, and that's why a lot of people continue to do this. Uh, although it's it's becoming um, somewhat more restricted now, relying more and more on specialized. Um, a more professional uh, coyotes and, uh, and the snake cats are becoming more specialized as opposed to back in the early 90s or even a late 80s. It was uh, pretty much a business open for all to enter. Uh, and it's, it is becoming more specialized. That's why the prices have been going up and up continuously. And I don't know where it's going to stop. So there must be a breaking point at some level that the Chinese will realize it's not worth the effort to do this anymore. Um, when I stopped um, asking for prices a few years back, it was about 60 grand to 70 grand. So if you come with children, that's going to be about $120,000 with two kids if you come. Um, uh, there's, there's, a, there's a greater use on fraudulent documents, uh, marriage frauds, um, business delegations, uh, different venues as opposed to strictly crossing borders. So, but that that was why you know the the last case broke up from uh, in, in broke up in Chiapas where the Mexican caught 500 some immigrants. You have scores of Chinese and mixed with Guatemalans, and it's, it's really got my interest in how that has still been still being practiced and on much such a large scale. So that's something I'm eager to find out too. Entre diciembre del año pasado y mayo de este, entrevistamos con mi equipo poco más de 20 traficantes de migrantes que viven en Centroamérica. Y una de las ideas principales que ellos nos dijeron, no todos, algunos, es que el, la incursión de los Zetas en el 
nuevo nicho de mercado, metió orden al mercado, porque ahora es más fácil entenderse con un solo interlocutor que les cobra una cantidad fija y les garantiza el paso desde la frontera sur hasta la frontera norte, mientras que antes no sabían cuántos eh, funcionarios iban a encontrar en el camino y a cada uno de ellos tenían que darles un monto para dejarles el paso. ¿No? En ese sentido, pareciera que la idea es de que mientras más profesional es el mercado delictivo, más garantías hay de que el convenio se cumpla. Esta idea no la, no la comparten altos mandos de inteligencia y de seguridad pública en México, quienes recurriendo al, apoyo, al, al argumento de que la red de redes delictivas que mueven los Zetas, la red más militarizada que tiene la visión estratégica de conjunto, sí puede dar ese tipo de garantía. En cambio, el componente local, es decir, aquel que tiene la franquicia Z para actuar en cada una de las localidades, en la medida en que sigue manteniendo sus propias formas de organización, sus propios objetivos específicos, aunque estén subordinados a una estrategia más grande, esos objetivos específicos es lo que no permite que haya una garantía plena de que el acuerdo superior sea respetado por cada una de las partes específicas. Entonces, esto nos habla de una tensión incluso al interior de dos trayectorias dentro de una misma organización en un nuevo nicho de mercado como es el de la transmigración. Yo espero que esto ayude a contestar lo que planteabas. En relación a lo que decía María, eh, el tema de las visas es un tema que se ha discutido mucho en México en los meses recientes a raíz de estos asesinatos masivos de, del año pasado al presente. Eh, y hay un día que internamente ciertas instancias del gobierno mexicano se pronuncia por dar una visa de paso para todos los centroamericanos y al día siguiente otro sector importante del propio gobierno federal presenta nuevos elementos de juicio que lleva a decir siempre no damos la visa. Esta discusión se mantiene vigente y es eh, algo que ocupa a los, altos, a los más altos niveles del gobierno mexicano. Yo creo que lo primero que tenemos que tener claro es que uno es el problema de seguridad pública que afecta a la población mexicana y a la población extranjera que vive o pasa por México. Ese es el problema principal. Tenemos un nuevo nicho de mercado delictivo que afecta a la seguridad pública e involucra a los migrantes pero no es un problema migratorio en sí mismo. Hay que hacer esa primera de gran distinción. Y segundo eh, elemento de distinción, el problema de las visas es un componente de una política migratoria de un Estado. En consecuencia, revisar si se dan visas o si se la, las tres eh, categorías que se usan en México, tres agrupamientos para nacionalidades restringidas, nacionalidades con visa o nacionalidades sin visa, están respondiendo también a una concepción de política migratoria y ese es el tema principal que México no ha abordado, incluso no está resuelto con la nueva ley de migración aprobada en mayo de este año. Entonces, son dos problemas. Uno es de seguridad pública y otro es de concepción de política migratoria en el país. Mm. Words here? I, I don't. Thanks. Thanks again. You're yeah, I just want to uh, thank uh, our panelists, especially for their work. Uh, we hope to take this subject up again in the future, not too distant future. Uh, so stay tuned for that. And thank my tokayo, Eric Lee, and the uh, North American Center for Transportive Studies at ASU for co sponsoring this event with us. Thank you all very much for your uh, patience and your participation.